Well, as we mentioned, it is indeed a great privilege for us to have Dr. John Whitcomb here with us, along with his wife, Norma. And uh, Dr. Whitcomb has been a professor of the Old Testament and theology for more than 50 years. He is widely recognized as a leading biblical scholar. He taught at Grace Theological Seminary in Winona Lake, Indiana. I'll get it out. From, listen to this, from 1951 to 1990. Is that not amazing? He gained much recognition for his work on the Genesis Flood, which he co-authored with Dr. Henry Morris in 1961. That book has been credited as one of the major catalysts for the modern biblical creationism movement. Among Dr. Wickham's other published works are The Early Earth, The World That Perished, and commentaries on Esther and Daniel. One of our flock groups just completed a study through that, if I'm not mistaken, using that book as one of the, uh, the books that they were studying. He's also authored six comprehensive Bible charts, a wealth of biblical and theological articles. Major emphasis in his teaching have been biblical creationism, Old Testament exposition, dispensational theology, premillennial eschatology, and presuppositional apologetics. Now, most of us choke on all those words, but uh, those are wonderful, wonderful truths. What I like in this little bio is his really his... Uh, life and ministry summed up in this quotation. I want to be in the full-time business of finding out what God says and telling as many people as I can. I love that, don't you? That's it right there. And, uh, you know, oftentimes people will ask me, how do you get a guy like John Whitcomb to come to your little church? And I first bristle at that because they don't know we're a mega church. <laughs> right? We have a campus. Right? Remember that, folks. We have a campus. We are a mega church. Right? But when people ask me that question, how do we get my first answer to that question is, is we ask them. That's it. We ask them. These men are, well, some of them, I guess, are up on pedestals, but uh, certainly uh, men like Dr. Whitcomb's are not. Uh, they are humble servants of God who want to proclaim his word whenever they can and wherever they can. Um, but the real reason, obviously, that we have men like Dr. Whitcomb and the reason we have him here is because God has greatly graced us. You need to know that, particularly you who are younger. You need to understand that, that uh, men like Dr. W Dr. Whitcomb are hard to find anymore. And uh, we have been greatly blessed. Every time he's come, when he's come to us on Sunday mornings, and I think it was 2002 we said that he was here at our uh, Bible conference, but... Um, because God has a message for us through him, and we would do well to listen to that. And to say that would also be to say that that means that you should, if you haven't already, plan on being here again this evening, and then Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday evenings, because, again, God has a word for us through Dr. Whitcomb, as he's been sharing with us. And I'll tell you what, every time he comes, he challenges my thinking. Just when I think I've got my eschatology all down, neatly bundled, you throw in something that I've never thought about before. So I praise the Lord for that. So you watch and see if there isn't something today that you hadn't thought about before, right? So God bless you, Dr. Wickham. Come and give us your word. Thank you, Pastor Emmerich. It's a joy for Norma and me to be back again. This is one of our all-time favorite churches in the beautiful Northwest, where everyone is happy all the time. <laughs> we appreciate so much the hospitality of the Hammer Masters who have invited us to stay in their beautiful home these days. And we look forward to greeting many of you. We hope you'll come up and meet our family up here in the front. These three wonderful children and grandchildren, we just hope you'll meet them too. We do have several things that we do not have on the book table out here. We hope you'll take a look at our display of Bible and science creation things on this end, things about Bible prophecy on this end, and other things in between. Be sure that you get our order form because we're, we only have one copy left, for example, of Norma's famous book on those mysterious dinosaurs, fabulous book for children now in 11 languages. Uh, we hope we can send them to you if you order them. We also recommend a couple of books that we didn't bring at all. 
um, more technical studies, heavy things about how the world will end, the future of the church in Israel. I contributed two chapters to this new book, Dispensationalism, Today and Beyond. And I hope you'll enjoy that. If you want one, just let me know. Give me your name and address. We'll try and order it for you. And also, Dr. McLean, my professor of theology 50 years ago, now, of course, along with the Lord, his masterpiece, The Greatness of the Kingdom. I don't carry all these books everywhere I go, but some of you might want that for your library, for your family, friends, loved ones. Let me know. And then we have this fabulous magazine that your church subscribes to, an order form out here, a list, sign up, you get six month free subscription, Israel My Glory. And then one of my all time favorites, a beautiful gospel card, how to tell Chinese people about Jesus, what he did, who he is, and how to know him. It's in Chinese and English. So go to a Chinese restaurant, enter expectantly, prayerfully, smile and say, Herrn Hao, watch what happens. God has brought hundreds of thousands of Chinese people to America for us to do what to? Evangelize, tell them about the Savior, pray for them. As I was raised in China and came back from China in 1930 speaking fluent Mandarin. My parents were there in the military and for three years as an only child I learned to love those people and their language and hope that you'll take one of these with you and at least pray for Chinese people. I, I just am amazed. I was raised in Seattle in the 1930s. My father uh, worked at Fort Lewis. We lived in Seattle overlooking Lake Union and I went to a high school called Broadway. 3,000 students, 2,000 of them were Japanese. I thought, where am I? Is this Tokyo or Seattle? <laughs> but thousands and thousands of Asians, right? From all those countries. And of course, you're praying for the Koreans who meet here, I believe, on Sunday afternoons, that God will reach these people with the truth of the Word of God. All right? Now, friends, we're just so thankful to welcome you to our prophecy conference, How the World Will End, the Rapture of the Church. Now, first of all, we'll take a little quick tour of the history of the universe. And you see how beautifully I have presented this. <laughs> For some reason, nothing is happening. All right? <laughs> Please use your imagination. This is supposed to be the five worlds of history, science and prophecy, which I put on a beautiful plastic chart with all the notes. None of them arrived. So uh, pray that somehow we'll make connections properly when we go to conferences like this and have everything we need, okay? Now, can you see that? The five worlds. Now here we go, friends. A bird's eye view of the history of the universe. Look, look where we've come from. Less than one month, a very good world experienced a catastrophe. Adam rejected the known will of God. The whole world was plunged into the curse from which it has never recovered to this day. Then came what? 1,656 years, the worst system this planet has ever known. So horrible, God saw that the wickedness of man was great upon the earth and that every thought of the imagination of his heart was only evil continually. And God destroyed the whole system except for eight people by what means? The flood, the Genesis flood. Fantastic hydrodynamic catastrophe. That introduced the third system, which we now live in, in which God created Israel to be his chosen people and the church, his bride, his body, which you and I represent if we're born again Christians. And that system, of course, could end any minute, even today, by what means? The resurrection rapture event, okay, the pre-tribulation rapture, which could happen today, and that will introduce the 70th and final week of Daniel 
and then the thousand year kingdom. God willing, this topic we will look at Wednesday night, our final session. The second coming, Tuesday night. Tomorrow night, that's seven year tribulation. Tonight, what the church will face at the rapture. Then the final fifth system world will last how long? Forever, Forever and ever and ever. Okay, now let's begin. One of the greatest scientists in all of history, Sir Isaac Newton, said this. He was a student of Bible prophecy. Imagine that now. About the time of the end, a body of men will be raised up who will turn their attention to the prophecies and insist upon their literal interpretation. Are you ready for this? In the midst of much clamor and opposition. We're here. Thank you, Isaac Newton. Okay? I'd like to summarize my approach to prophecy. I'm not sure, folks, if you can, am I in the way here? Can you see all right? Thank you. For many centuries, the church has been subjected to various spiritualizing. That means twisting the text to make it think, say what you think it should say. That's bad. Spiritualizing interpretations of Old and New Testament prophecies concerning the second coming of Christ. It is our prayer that God will raise up Many faithful students of his word, that includes everyone in this room, I trust. That's why we're here, okay? In these last days, who will search the prof prophetic scriptures in the belief that God, now this is a shocker, that God actually means what he says. That's why we're here. Thank you, Lord. Now, this is a little complicated. I won't take a lot of your time. Listen carefully, if you can, to what God said. In the book of Daniel, through Gabriel, an angel, to one of the greatest prophets who ever lived. Now, did you know that Jesus highly recommends the book of Daniel? Here's what he said. When you see the abomination of desolation, stand in the holy place. Let him who reads understand. See? Then flee for your lives. He said what? Read understandingly, the book of Daniel. That is the foundation book for the whole book of Revelation. And you can't understand the book of Revelation unless you know the book of Daniel. And let me add this. The book of Revelation is like a capstone, a pinnacle of a gigantic pyramid of revealed, written scripture preceded by and standing on the top of and presupposing the truth of 65 other books of the Bible. The book of Revelation assumes that you have mastered the first 65 books, or much of it is not capable of being understood. And that's why some of the greatest theologians in the history of the church have stumbled and fallen at the book of Revelation, because they have not thought through carefully everything else God had said already about the history, destiny, function, and uniqueness of what? Of Israel and the church, and how they connect with each other, okay? Those are enormous themes in the Bible. Beginning in Genesis 12, the beginning of God's unconditional covenant to Israel and the day of Pentecost, 50 days after Jesus rose from the dead, the beginning and creation of the church. How do they compare? How do they differ? What are these movements, these organisms really for in the plan of God? Because if you're a born again Christian, you're a permanent member of what? the true church, the body and bride of Christ, okay? Now, 2,600 years ago, an angel visited Daniel. This is Daniel chapter nine, his name was Gabriel. And Gabriel said to Daniel, okay, 70 weeks are what? Decreed for your people and your holy city. Now that's not New York City or Rome, that's Jerusalem. And your people are who? The Jews, exclusively. Watch that. 70 weeks. Well, 69 weeks ended before Jesus died on the cross. That's what Gabriel said. After the 69 weeks, which is 483 years, <clears throat> Messiah the Prince will be cut off and have nothing. That's Jesus. 
Then what will happen? Now, this is horrible. Then the prince who shall come, that's the Antichrist of whom he had already spoken in Daniel 7, okay? The prince that shall come shall what? Make a firm covenant with many, the majority of Jews, for one week, one seven-year period, the 70th and last week of the 70, okay? And in the midst of the week, he will do what? He'll break the covenant and cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Now that, in the mind of God, is one of the most horrible things that's ever happened or ever will. Okay? It hasn't happened yet, but it will. And we'll be talking about that, God willing, tomorrow night. Okay? The abomination of desolation. Now, friends, there's only one time, as we'll see, that Jesus ever spoke specifically of the Antichrist. We'll talk about that tomorrow night, too. If you can't come, please pray that we'll be able to accomplish great things under God as we analyze and evaluate these amazing prophecies of what's coming. Okay? Now, God, here's, here's what we're trying to say now. You ready? God did not include the church, his bride, in any of the first 69 weeks. We weren't here. The church was not created till what? 50 days after Jesus rose from the dead. That's why we call it Pentecost, 50. There was no church back here, none. All God's people were Jews. And to become saved, you had to become a Jew. Remember Ruth the Moabitess? She wanted to worship the God of uh, Naomi, her mother-in-law. And that's how she got saved. Okay? You remember what Jesus said about that to the Samaritan woman? Salvation is what? Of the Jews. Of the Jews. That's the only way to get to heaven in the Old Testament, become a Jew. Okay? Now watch. God did not include the church in any of the first 69 weeks because the church began after Christ died, which is after the first 69 weeks had been completed. Number two, God did not allow Israel's laws and ordinances to be incorporated into the church. This is a major problem in the New Testament. God said, don't you Christians ever get yourself into Judaism. That program is temporarily broken off, finished. Okay? Don't let anyone talking to you in, in, to, to make you worship God on Saturday, Sabbatarianism, or to try to offer an animal sacrifice, or to have a priest. No, that's over. There are enormous differences between the, Israel and the church. Don't mix the programs. Now, I, I normally don't like to mention false religions, but I'm going to have to do it now. Please understand me. If you have a problem, I'll, I'll talk to you afterward. I'll try to help. One billion people today are utterly confused. They think they're Israel. Who are they? The Roman Catholic Church, which has the high priest, Pontifex Maximus, the Pope, which has other priests, see, which offers sacrifices. What's that, the Mass? Re-offering the what? The body of Jesus, which miraculously the bread and the wine becomes his body. This is utter blasphemy. A re-sacrifice of Jesus. Jesus said on the cross, it is what? Finished. See what we're doing? Don't think that we have replaced Israel. That's why we have a book out on the table called Future Israel. <laughs> the church has not replaced Israel. You say, well, I thought Israel rejected Jesus and crucified him. Now, here's a problem. The Jews are completely unworthy of any hope of God's restoration. Completely unworthy. But wait a minute, so are we. <laughs> We're not worthy of going to heaven, of being saved. That isn't the issue. Israel was saved by the grace of God, according to what, an unconditional covenant to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, that God will not break. And the apostle Paul makes it crystal clear the Jews are enemies for, for the gospel's sake. They hate Jesus, they hate the gospel. But wait a minute, you ready for this one? But they're beloved for the Father's sake. That's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to whom God made a promise that someday Israel would repent and be saved. Now the Jews said awful things about Jesus when he was here. I mean, this makes me shudder. They said, we will not have this man to reign over us. Crucify him. They said, let his blood be on us, and what? Our children forever. Oh, 
No. And you know how Jesus responded? He said, you will never see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Did you get it? You'll never see me again, what? Until. In other words, they're, <clears throat> they're being broken off of the tree of divine blessing during the church age is temporary, not permanent, is partial, not complete. In other words, Jews can be saved today, at which point they become what? Christians, members of the church. The only way a Jew can be saved today is becoming a Christian, because there's only one program on this planet, and that's the true church. That's it. We have our own distinctive ordinances, church government, destiny, as we'll see this week, God willing. The one thing we have in common with all believing Jews of ages past and ages future is what? We're all saved by grace, not works, through what? The Holy Spirit's convicting of sin, righteousness, and judgment through the written word, the Bible, see? By the grace of God based on the merits of the blood of Jesus on the cross. We have that in common. Nobody has ever been saved, ever will be any other way. But the differences are enormous between Israel and the church, and Gabriel said so. He said to Daniel, now this is exclusively for Jews, Daniel. And by that 70th week, something enormous will happen on this planet. The kingdom, which will last a thousand years, is being prepared for by Jews coming back to Jesus and winning millions of Gentiles to Jesus also. Okay? Now, church ordinances and distinctives will not be allowed to continue into the 70th week of Daniel. You see, friends, when that 70th week comes, the church won't be here. We'll be where? In heaven, having been raptured. Okay? Now, I, I agree this is getting complicated. Now, a distinct destiny for the church and Israel. Israel will be on the earth, will be in heaven during those last seven years before the kingdom comes right here. And so during that tribulation period, friends, you have two choices. Become a Jew by believing in the God of Israel or die forever under the curse of God because of the mark of the beast, Antichrist. Okay? It's an awful, awful time. Jesus said this period of time, never again, never again will there be a time as horrible as this will be right here. Okay? So during that time, you say, you say there's no church on earth? No. Oh, wait a minute. Wait. There is a church. A false one. The false church riding on the back of the beast, the Antichrist. It was every... Uh, makes me weep. Hundreds of millions of people who think they're Christians today and are not will miss the rapture and be left behind and face the Antichrist and it will be used by him, the apostate church, and he will destroy it when he's through with it in the middle of the 70th week, as we'll see tomorrow night, God willing. Friends, never depend upon your church membership or where your parents went. You have to know what? The Savior personally. Have you ever heard that before? This is infinitely important, okay? So after the rapture, there will be a church here. All the major denominations, hundreds of millions of people who think they're Christians will be left behind and face the Antichrist. Okay? And I say, well, Lord, this is, this is awful. There won't be any true church here at all. You have to be saved by becoming a believing Israelite at that time. Okay? So God said to that great church at, uh, of uh, in Revelation 3:10, the Church of Philadelphia, you, you, you have kept the word of my perseverance. I'll keep you from the hour of testing. You won't, get, you won't be here. You'll not be in that period. See, the hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell upon the earth. That's unbelievers. And God says, there won't be any partial rapture. If you're a true believer, you're going up. You say, what in the world is a partial rapture? Can you imagine some Bible teachers years ago came up with this idea, which sounds logical. I'm, I'm impressed with it, aren't you? That 
at the rapture of the church, God won't just take any Christian, every Christian, he'll only take the most faithful Christians, the worthy ones. Oh, really? If only worthy Christians go up, how many go up? None. That's the end of the partial rapture view. <laughs> I'd like to make this announcement. At the rapture of the church, which could happen today, every born-again Christian, man, woman, and child on this planet disappears. It's like that. Every born-again Christian. You say, well, wonder if some Christians are not worthy, have not done well, have not been faithful. That's our topic tonight. It's called what? The judgment throne of Christ, where everything Christians have ever done since they were truly saved will be brought to light, evaluated, analyzed, and dealt with by Jesus. That's a very complex topic. If you can't come, please pray that we'll accomplish God's purpose tonight in studying that together, okay? Now, here it is, the 70th and last week of Daniel. Here's the church up here in heaven, seven years of evaluation, analysis, examination going on. That's our final exam. You know, old professors never die, they just keep giving exams. And I say, Lord, I think I see the need for that. You're not just gonna usher us into our eternal destiny with no evaluation at all. You, you knew that couldn't happen with Jesus, okay? But what's, what's gonna happen here on the earth? Look, as soon as the church is raptured, all kinds of amazing things start happening. The two witnesses appear, the Antichrist appears, the king of the north begins to prepare his invasion of Israel. The Antichrist is killed, rises from the dead, kills the two witnesses, sets up the abomination of desolation. In the meantime, 144,000 true witnesses of God, Jews, 72,000 gospel teams of two men each. Jesus, here's what he, Jesus said they'll do. This gospel of the kingdom shall be proclaimed to all nations, and then shall the end come. I'm so thrilled that this church believes in missionaries. Folks, we have not completed the Great Commission assignment. There are millions of people who've never heard one word of the gospel or read one word of the Bible. Not yet. Well, what the church, the bride of Christ, has failed to do, if the rapture is today, Israel will accomplish before the end comes, the second coming and Armageddon. Now folks, as you think of the rapture of the church, it's absolutely spectacular what God has said will happen. He's gonna make an enormous exception to a biblical rule, law, guideline. You heard this one? It is appointed unto men, what? Once to die. Oh, there have been some exceptions. The, the person that Elijah raised from the dead died twice. The person Elisha raised from the dead died, died twice. Many of the people Jesus raised from the dead died twice, including Lazarus. Exceptions. And especially millions of people who are born again Christians when the rapture happens will never die. That's the blessed hope for the true church of Christ. Never experience physical death, okay? I say that is amazing. Lord, thank you for these exceptions. Just like that rule, here's a, here's a guideline. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, but who knows an exception? Jesus. Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for that exception. Who was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin, ever, once. Amazing. Okay, now, the rapture of the church, friends, it could happen within five minutes. <laughs> in which case the rest of the conference is canceled. <laughs> How's it gonna happen? Are you ready? Paul the Apostle said, behold, I show you a mystery. A mystery, musterion, in the New Testament is not something spooky or strange or weird. It means what? Something previously hidden by God and now at last revealed, revealed. Hidden, revealed, mystery. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep the sleep of death, but we'll all be changed in a moment. The twinkling of an eye at the last trump for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we'll be changed. How many will agree with me we need a change? Listen to how it's going to happen. 
it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be what? Like him. like him, for we shall see him as he is. And this hope we have in him purifies us, even as he is pure. It transforms our perspective, our self-evaluation, and says, Lord, I have to be ready for you. Help me to do it, to do what's necessary to please you. I could meet you today. That does something to a person, OK? You say, well, wait a minute now. <clears throat> How's this going to happen? OK? Now turn in your Bible to 1 Thessalonians 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. This is something God says through Paul the Apostle will comfort God's people as nothing else can. 1 Thessalonians 4. Verse 13, how is this going to happen? Are you ready? 1 Thessalonians 4.13, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren. That's why we have a Bible conference, isn't it? About those who are asleep. Now that means a dead Christian. Because they look like they're sleeping. Their body is motionless. But they're going to awaken someday. Resurrection or, rap, or resurrection day. They look like they're sleeping. That's what Jesus told the apostles about, about Lazarus. He, he's sleeping. And they said, well, that's fine. Then he's going to get better. He said, no, he's dead. But watch me. I'm going to awaken him. Okay? Now, now watch. That you may not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. You're special. You have hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Question, do you believe that? Even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus, who've died, believing in him, trusting in him. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord. Now, this is controversial and will be what? Denied, ignored by many. But Paul says, by the word of the Lord, I'm telling you this, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. We're not going to be glorified first. God is going to honor dead Christians first. Some of them have been dead for nearly 2,000 years, friends. And he'll honor them and say, you're going to be glorified first. Now, question. Are you ready for this one? Until that moment, how many other humans have been glorified? Only one. Jesus Christ, the Lord, is the only, he's the first fruits of them that slept. Many have been resuscitated to temporary life and died again. He's the only one who's ever been finally, totally glorified at the right hand of the Father. But when the rapture happens, just before the rapture of the church, every dead Christian who's ever died in the last 2,000 years will join Jesus with a glorified body. Okay? Moments later, what's going to happen? You ready? Verse 16. For the Lord himself, not an angel, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Think of it, friends. There'll be what? A shout. When Jesus shouts at somebody, something's going to happen. Are you ready? Now, take, try this one. Lazarus is totally dead. Would you agree? Four days rotting in a tomb. I want a video of this. Jesus spoke to his father momentarily in heaven. Then he said with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. What happened? He did. Thank you. Perfectly well. No need of convalescence, recuperation. He was perfectly fine now, having been dead for four days. If Jesus hadn't specified Lazarus, every corpse on this planet would have risen. Lazarus, come forth. That's how the universe began. Jesus spoke, there's the earth, angels, moon, sun, planets, stars. He's very powerful. How many think he can handle this one? Thank you. He says, watch me. Okay? And what else is going to happen? The voice of the archangel, because see, Michael, who has been cut off, see, broken off the tree of blessing, all these 2,000 years, will be reinstated to begin his function and prepare to throw Satan out of heaven. 
he will say, Amen. Goodbye, church. I'm now taking over Israel that is being, what, grafted back into the tree of blessing. Romans 11, right here. The voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. And what will happen? Are you ready? The dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, clouds of glory, to meet the Lord in the air, not on the earth. And there we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Thank you, Lord. This is comforting. Something huge is going to happen. Caught up. That's the Greek verb harpazo, from which we get two English words. Harpoon, which is an instrument that plucks whales out of the ocean. And harp, an instrument by which, if you pluck it, music comes out. We'll be harped out of the world. We'll be harpooned out of this planet. We'll meet the Lord in the air. Not his second coming to the earth. Because Jesus hinted that that in, at this rapture in the upper room, and the disciples didn't have the faintest idea what he meant. Here's what he said. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will what? Come again. Now, you ready? And receive you to myself. We're going back up. That's the rapture. They didn't know that. They didn't know that he meant they would go up without dying. Later, Paul and the other apostles explained the details. Jesus gave a hint. I'll meet you someday in the air and take you all the way back where you belong. Our citizenship, friends, is in heaven, from whence we look for the Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall transform this body of humiliation and fashion it anew like unto his glorious body with that power whereby he's able to subdue all things to himself. That's an enormous event. He's going to take his bride home, and her home is in heaven. The home for Israel is the earth. Okay? We're going up. And I say, Lord, just help me to take this seriously and to rejoice in the details that you've entrusted to us because it says, therefore, comfort one another with these words. And I say, thank you, Lord. I am comforted. Help me now to be assured that I'm going up when you call the church, your body, your bride. Help me to reach loved ones, friends, family, neighbors, that they too can have the assurance that they're going up too and will not have to face the beast, the Antichrist, in the horrors of the tribulation for those who are left behind. That's the big one, isn't it, friends? Do you know the Lord? Settle things with Jesus? Are you part of his bride? John the Baptist said, I'm not. I'm a friend of the bridegroom. I'm not part of the church. But you are. And your position under God is higher than John the Baptist ever was because the bride and body of Christ is number one in the universe, even higher than angels. And I say, Lord, that's amazing. What grace, what love. I trust you and thank you. Let's pray. Father, now, it's overwhelming even to glance at some of these points that you have entrusted to us through the prophetic scriptures. Help me to believe what you wrote, to understand day by day more and more by, of what you meant by what you said, and to look for opportunities to share these precious truths with those you bring across the pathways of our lives. Bless the Valley Bible Church, the whole ministry here, May God's word be carefully, faithfully taught to God's dear people. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and we'll close our service this morning by singing this prayer, Change My Heart, O God. Change my heart, O oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God, may I be like you. 
having the Bible conference today, we're still going to have soup and sandwich Sunday. So you are invited to join us for a soup, some soup and a sandwich after uh, this service. So let's pray and then we'll be dismissed to our meal. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together around your word. We thank you for Dr. Whitcomb coming and ministering to us. Father, we thank you that we can now gather together around the table and fellowship with one another. We thank you for this meal that has been prepared. We ask your blessing upon it. These things we pray in Jesus' name.